Good morning, Hope City. Good morning. <laughs> I don't know what the middle is nowadays, but hopefully this is it's okay. Um, if we haven't met before, my name's Andrew, and I'm part of the team here. Um, before we get started, I just really want to say a quick thank you um, to everyone for praying for me uh, and checking in regularly. Um, in case you haven't heard what the exact health issue is, it's um, a disc bulge on the lower back. Uh, with a pinched nerve, so that has um, been giving me pain down the leg for the last five or six months, uh, and it's been horrible. <laughs> um, and I got a steroid injection about two and a half weeks ago, um, and it hasn't worked at this point, uh, so I'm still on pain meds. Um, but I'm confident that God will heal me, and um, I know that I'm meant to grow during this trial, but it's been hard to be positive at times, and there's been a lot of other stuff happening with the family as well. So um, please continue to pray for us. Uh, I really believe that this is a community, our community that can um, lift us up in prayer. And I know there's a lot of, not a lot, but there are other people that have been going through a lot of health issues in our midst as well. So please continue to pray for them and what they're going through. Um, so I'm hopeful and truly believe in the power of prayer. I really do believe, uh, believe that God can heal us. Um, so let's see what he can do. All right, so thank you. Um, this morning, we are on the second part of a short series on Jesus and money. Uh, so Jason's going to finish the series off for us next week on generosity as spiritual maturity. And uh, some of the themes may overlap um, during these three weeks, which I think is great because there's so much to consider and learn and think about when it comes to how Jesus views money and possessions. Uh, so if you weren't here last week, I just want to reiterate, like Phil said, um, that we're not having this series because the church finances are in trouble or because we want to pressure you to give more. Um, in fact, I've seen numerous examples of how generous this community is and how intentional people are um, with the things that they have uh, and how they give to others. So there's no ulterior motive here. Let's just make that clear. Um, the purpose of this series is for us to recognize the importance of examining our relationship uh, with Jesus and also with money. So as mentioned last week, Jesus talks about money a lot. Uh, he actually talked about it more than faith and prayer combined. I found this stat that 11 out of 40 parables are about money, or uh, they use money as a way to teach spiritual truth. So to recap, last week, Phil started off uh, with the theology of stewardship, sharing that Jesus talks so much about money because it reveals our true priorities. So where we store up treasures uh, shows where our heart is, whether that's treasures on earth or in heaven. And, you know, the transactions on our bank statements, um, they reveal a lot about who we are and what we value, don't they? Um, money is a rival God for many people uh, or maybe everyone at some point where we are faced with choosing between uh, what we want to do with our wealth and possessions and what God wants for us. But we cannot serve both God and money. And in last week's passage from Matthew 19, Jesus told them that he had to be willing to sell his possessions and give to the poor and follow Jesus wholeheartedly, which was a hard word for the man to hear because he had great wealth. And it's not easy to choose Jesus over everything we have, but Jesus told his disciples after that if they follow him, they will receive a hundred times as much and inherit eternal life. So as we continue to hear and talk about money, maybe we can ask ourselves, has money created any separation between ourselves and God? It's a common battle for us as believers to struggle to align ourselves with God's will when it comes to finances and possessions. But if we choose to worship money as our God, it causes us to worship ourselves as we indulge in our own comfort and pleasure and if we truly understand our role as stewards of God's earth and resources, then we can invest what we have been given into growing his kingdom. Again, if we choose to worship money as our God, it causes us to worship ourselves as we indulge in our own comfort and pleasure. But if we truly understand that we are stewards of God's earth and resources and that everything belongs to him, we can invest what we have been given into growing his kingdom. So today we're thinking about what practical stewardship means for each one of us. And at the root of that is our relationship with Jesus. So the plan for today is to go through the text, glean what we can from it, and then spend some time on practical ways we can approach stewardship. 
So our text for this morning is from Luke 12, 13 to 21. You can turn to that in your Bibles. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. Uh, It's a short parable that is only found in the book of Luke and not in the other Gospels, but certainly worth paying attention to. And so the passage is titled, if you kind of have the subtitles in your Bible, The Parable of the Rich Fool. So Luke 12, 13, 21, let's read through that. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, Who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this passage can be divided into two sections uh, where Jesus first talks about the temptation of greed and then he tells the parable or a simple story to illustrate his point. And it begins with a man coming to Jesus with a request. In verse 13, so he says, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And the details are not clear here. We don't really get much. But this man is asking Jesus who he sees as a highly respected teacher, to settle the conflict. So in first century Jewish cultures, often um, it's common for rabbis to be asked to mediate disputes or or highly respected teachers of the law. But here, the person wasn't asking for mediation to help come to an agreement with his brother. He wanted Jesus to choose his side and represent him, to be his advocate. He wanted a decision in his favor. So that's not mediation, right? He says, represent me. Tell my brother to give me the inheritance. So there's this legitimate concern here for the man about his inheritance or the inheritance and also a potential clue here that there's a danger of greed. We don't know the story. Was he meant to get an inheritance? Is his brother, for the, is his brother the firstborn son who received it all? We're not sure. But this provides the setting for the teaching that it's about to follow. So Jesus first responds by posing this question. Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? And the way Jesus says man here is in a rebuking way. He actually refuses to judge between the two, and he forces the man to consider who Jesus is. He's not just a teacher, but really he's the ultimate judge of this man and judge over all of us. And so Jesus might even be asking here if the man really knows who he's talking to and the authority that Jesus has. But right now, his role is not to be judge. Uh, he's not going to do that for them because he, he came to bring people to God, not bring property and possessions to us. So instead, he takes the opportunity to deal with another issue, the man's materialism. And he warns the people again in verse 15, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. So Jesus warns against all kinds of greed here. And we have some definitions up here. Greed meaning an intense and selfish desire for something, especially wealth, power, or food. And when we look at the Greek word for greed here, it also means avarice, uh, which means extreme greed for wealth or material gain. Really, really, really greedy. And it also means uh, covetousness or to covet, um, a strong wish to have something, especially something that belongs to someone else. So if you're familiar with the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, it says we are not to covet anything that is our neighbor's. We are not to desire what does not belong to us. So what kind of greed lies in our hearts today? Maybe there's a greed that we have not noticed inside of us, uh, or is there a selfish desire for something that we don't recognize is wrong, or extreme greed, or coveting what belongs to someone else? Next comes what I think is the essence of God's word for us today, that life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. 
Jesus warns us to be on guard against all kinds of greed, and he teaches that life is not about possessions. It's not about having all this stuff. It's not defined by what you have, uh, even if you have a lot. And so the warning here just covers more than money, and it also refers to our attitude or our posture about money and things. And Jesus is warning against the strong desire to acquire more and more. It's not always bigger is better or more is better. And yet we live in a world that says the one with the most toys wins, the one with the best connections wins, the one with the most money wins, the one at the top wins. But we know in reality, even if you refuse to admit it, that this is a prescription for failure in life. Wealth does not make us happy in the long run. It, life consists of more than accumulation of wealth. And scripture repeatedly warns against greed, and it's always included in these passages that list immoral and sinful behavior that we should avoid. Greed is always in, in those lists. And Jesus is warning us of the greed that can overtake us, that life is not about what we have or own, and it can actually lift possessions up to a place more important and greater than our actual quality of life. An abundance of things and possessions does not equal life. Uh, things will not give us fullness of life. Maybe for a time we'll feel satisfied, but it will not be long lived and we can continue to feel a void if we're looking for life and joy and fulfillment only in money and things and experiences and hobbies and even people. The man asking Jesus to help him get the inheritance is implying that his life would be better if he had more. But we're called to seek God rather than riches because God brings true fulfillment to our lives. And as we learned last week, he's blessed us with relationships and created us for them, with ourselves, with others, with creation, and ultimately with himself. But when possessions are the goal, people can become pawns. They can, they can get used. And greed, whatever form, uh, is the sin that results in that, an idolatry of wealth, power, materialism. And out of that can come damage to our relationships that God has created us for. If we make the material world our God and we serve dollars and things and allow them to control us rather than have money serve us for good purposes, Jesus said in Luke 9, 25, what does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? This is why Jesus warns us against greed. Our lives can spiral to a point of destruction if we neglect what is most important because we decide to chase paper and nice things or we hoard everything and keep it to ourselves. And we know and we believe as followers of Jesus that he has blessed us with everything that we have. Yes, we may have worked hard for it, but we know that our ability, our talent, our knowledge, and the skills that have enabled us to work, our physical body, and the wisdom in our minds, those have all been given to us by God, our creator. Therefore, we are called to be practical stewards of our money, our time, resources, possessions, everything. So we now come to this parable that Jesus tells us uh, as an example of what we should not do with what we have been given. And the man here is an example of a type of person who has a fortune and how he handles that fortune and why we should not be like him. So we have this rich man here in verses uh, 16 uh, who had an abundant harvest and has no place to store the crops. He decides to tear down the barns and build bigger ones to store the extra grain. And the man is smart here to recognize the problem. I'm out of space, I have too much. And he's thinking about the future. So he did what's reasonable, what makes sense. Let's build bigger barns to store the extra grain. But the issue here actually is in what he decides to do and his solution and what he decides not to do, what he fails to consider in the plans that he made. So the rationale and the desires that result from his decision are also the problem here and his arrogance that we're about to see. So in verse 19, I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. There's only self-interest here for the farmer. Uh, there's so much focus when you look at just these couple of verses on the first person when we read through it. What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. 
This is what I will do. And I will tell myself to take life easy. The focus is all on himself. And this phrase of eat, drink, and be merry, it comes from the biblical and Jewish texts of hedonism, pleasure, and indulgence. And it comes from Greek culture as well. And the man believes that what he has is his, and he believes that more wealth will lead to less worry in life. Some people make money their God because they believe it will make them happy. To illustrate Jesus' point, this man did think that life considered, uh, consisted in the abundance of possessions alone. But there is more to life than he realized. There is more beyond this life. And he has no hint or awareness um, or of stewardship or responsibility to others as a result of his fortune. He figured he earned it, he can indulge in it and live a comfortable life. But God didn't intend for us to live this way, for us to make money our God and store up possessions and things for ourselves in greed. Although the world has taught us to love material possessions and tells us to keep buying and spending even when we have enough, I was thinking about the biblical justice series we're gonna have in a few weeks, and I started to wonder, what would the world look like if greed and selfishness did not exist? Would the majority of the world not be living in poverty, scrambling to make ends meet? Would people have enough to eat every day, able to live in safe, clean, house, spacious housing, and able to get the care they need for their health? Would we all be able to own homes? I wonder if everyone had what they needed, would there be less human trafficking, less slave labor, and a lot less injustice out there? People wouldn't need to exploit other people to earn enough for themselves if there was an equal distribution of wealth. I wonder. We can make an impact as individuals, as, as families, as a church, if we remember that God doesn't want us to live selfishly, and we can see how God leads us and what he will do if that is our mindset and our posture and our attitude towards what we have been given. He didn't intend for us to make money our God and live out of fear and anxiety either, to not trust that he will provide all that we need, not everything we want, but everything that we need. Because maybe he knows that if we get everything that we want, we'll become complacent and we won't do anything for, to further his plan for us in this world like this rich man. We will just be comfortable selfish and greedy, which is not what we are called to. We'll, we will want more and more when God may be saying to us, this is not how I want you to use what I have given you, not at all. So not surprisingly, God does not respond to the man with a good job, you worked hard and you have an abundance now and you can just enjoy life. He calls him a fool in verse 20. Fool in the Old Testament refers to someone who disbelieves or disregards God. Uh, a fool is someone who is senseless, uh, stupid, without reflection or intelligence, acting rashly. And Jesus calls him a fool because before the man can even begin to enjoy what he thinks is endless wealth, Jesus says that he will die. Uh, it's kind of a shocker. Um, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. And so the man can boast about his own plans, but now that his life will be taken from him, he would have nothing left and his possessions would pass on to his heirs or who knows what would happen to his, the possessions or the grain that he stored up. What would his heirs do with the abundance of crops if he even had anybody um, to inherit his fortune? In Ecclesiastes 2, 18 to 19, the writer says, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish, yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So we may sit comfortably thinking, we have a lot of time to enjoy everything, that, um, but wealth is not something we can fully rely on. For the man who asks about his inheritance, even if he got a part of his brother's inheritance. Jesus is saying here, you don't know how long you're gonna keep it for. You don't know how life will go. And so the rich fool will get a life after death without God. His wealth prevented him from the need to develop a relationship with God. And this man is called a fool by Jesus because he focuses on his time on earth instead of eternity. He only considers his physical body 
eat, drink, and be merry, and he doesn't consider his soul, and he fails to realize that what he thought was his is actually God's. What God wants us to do with what we've been given is the complete opposite of what this rich fool has done. We were not called to live comfortably in the sense that we have tenfold or a hundredfold more than what we need to have riches sitting there only for our own benefit. This parable teaches us that we are not to waste what God has given to us by hoarding it for ourselves. And what's important um, is our personal relationship with Jesus and for us to understand what he's saying to each one of us about money and possessions, our lifestyle, our habits, our future, ensuring that the legacy that we wish to leave behind aligns with what we have been called to as followers of Jesus, to reflect that everything that we have have been given came from him. What is Jesus saying to us now about what we have been given to steward, to take care of, to use for good? Um, are we keeping something for ourselves that God wants us to give back to him for his purposes? Or is there something pressing on your heart, a conviction from the Holy Spirit to make a change in your lifestyle, how you spend your money? And how are you going to respond to the Holy Spirit? Jesus ends the parable by saying, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. He rebukes selfishness here and the rich fool for accumulating riches only for himself. He loves wealth instead of God, and he's not generous toward the poor. What if he loved God and he held wealth lightly, giving generously to the needy, investing money into sustainable goods and services on his farm, creating jobs on his land, and treating people with justice and fairness in their work. Maybe that's how God wanted him to use his riches. If we only seek to enrich ourselves, to boost up ourselves, and not store up treasures in heaven, Jesus is saying that we are fools and we are not rich in God's eyes. If we seek wealth, we end up with an empty soul and an empty life. And Jesus is not saying that possessions are bad, but it is pointless to selfishly pursue things. Instead, we're meant to responsibly steward things to benefit those around us and not misuse what God has blessed us with. So we have this negative example here of what could have been an opportunity for generosity and blessing, but instead it became a stumbling block for the man's soul. When I was trying to think about a positive example of stewardship, uh, the, the most recent one that came to mind is the brand Patagonia, the outdoor um, clothing and gear company. I've talked to some of you about this. Uh, you may have heard their slogan is, we're in business to save our home planet. And the brand focuses a lot on environmental sustainability. I'm sure you've seen people wearing their gear. And on the tags for their products, there's a list of the organic and recycled material and the nature-based solutions that were used. To, to make the material or the product and how much less water and carbon dioxide was used. Stats like that are on the tag for, for the products. And the company gives away 1% of sales each year, but to address the environmental crisis of the earth, uh, where we are at now, that's not enough. So they decided to transfer voting stock to a trust to protect the company's values and non-voting stock uh, is being given to a nonprofit dedicated to environmental causes. And so it's a lot of money. And so each year, the money they make after reinvesting in the business will be distributed as a dividend to help fight the environmental crisis. So now they say that Earth is their only shareholder. I, d I don't know if I want to support cheap and fast fashion or luxury fashion. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's a good idea to support products made from material that is harmful to the environment. Um, I know I need to be a lot more conscious of what I'm buying these days and how that can impact the earth and even my own health, like clean food, sustainable fashion, quality shoes um, that properly support my feet, fair trade, uh, things like that that can be re reused, recycled. So when I heard about this, I thought this is a brand that I can get behind maybe and support and a good use of money if I'm planning to buy the types of products that they sell. And there are critics wondering about the true motivation behind this. Those of you that read business articles might know uh, we're not sure about the motives, uh, maybe to avoid taxes, but I'm going to have to do my research to see how things work out. 
But it's important to really think about how we use what we have been given and for us as a believer, um, some of us might be wrestling with how to practice being responsible stewards. Maybe this is not something that we think of. We're not conscious of it. Um, so based on today's passage, I kind of created a list or maybe even an order of how to approach a decision you might need to make about stewardship, since we're talking about practical stewardship. So the first thing is to accept God's view of stewardship reiterating the point of this parable that life is not about ourselves or our possessions. It's about giving all of yourself and what we have been given back to God. It's about full surrender to Jesus, knowing that he will provide you with the finances that you need. And if we're looking for security, we can only find it in him. We can try to plan the rest of our lives um, through financial planning and, and saving, and which is a wise way to steward our finances. Yes, but Jesus is also asking that we give sacrificially. So Jesus wants us to become stewards who trust um, in him and are rich toward God and not ourselves. It's not about I or me. And after we understand and accept this, our posture should change or it will change uh, where we focus on cheerful giving for the purpose of being a blessing, to not be reluctant or resentful when we give. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, it says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So it's not about the amount, and nobody's checking you know, how much you're giving and what you're giving to, but it's about your heart. Uh, not giving you know, um, reluctantly or because you feel forced to or pressured to, but God loves a cheerful giver, and it's a choice to give. So much would not get done without giving uh, in this world. We have to give time and effort to our work. We have to give words and affection to our relationships. We have to give food even to our pets um, and money to things that we believe in. And if we decide not to give, these things will not exist or happen. So we get to choose every day what we will give to. So when we do give, we are to take a posture that is generous and not have an attitude in our hearts of being resentful or reluctant when we give. What we have to steward is not for us to keep. It's to guard and keep safe and then to use for God's glory, for his purposes, to demonstrate what he can do and the goodness and abundant blessing that he will bring. So when God favors us, we are to be a blessing to others. And thirdly, prayer and discernment. So as we think about how God may be calling us to steward, Money, time, resources, gifts, the knowledge he's blessed us with. Um, be on the lookout for causes and needs we can attach ourselves to. Uh, you know, when we have this series on biblical justice coming up, there will be focus on local and global issues of justice. Um, perhaps God will speak to some of us about getting involved and using what we've been given for these causes to help God rescue and save those facing oppression and injustice to save the beautiful earth that God has so intricately and wonderfully made that is dying. Um, so prayer and discernment, and then decide how much of God's money will you keep? Not how much of our money that we're gonna give, but how much of God's money you will keep. So there's a quote here from a theologian, uh, Richard Foster. God's ownership of everything also changes the kind of question we ask in giving. Rather than how much of my money should I give to God, we learn to ask how much of God's money should I keep for myself? And the difference between these two questions is of monumental proportions. So decide how much of what God has given to you to give back to him. And if we truly believe that life is eternal, then uh, we're gonna invest in what's important. We're gonna pour our energy and resources into practices and actions that look toward eternity. And finally, give uh, biblical generosity. So commit and don't let wealth become a stumbling block for your soul. Follow through to, act, to actually do what God has led you to do. Greed and the pursuit of possessions are one of the greatest obstacles to spiritual growth. But we don't want to displace God in our lives. He wants us to recognize that our lives are not defined by what we have, but by God's love for us and his call upon us. He expects us to be transformed by our encounters with Jesus, which will then be reflected in how we live, including how we use and take care of what we have been given. And we can look to the early church in Acts 2, which practiced biblical generosity 
and demonstrated true commitment to Jesus and community. They devoted themselves to apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayer. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they met together with glad and sincere hearts. They praised God and enjoyed the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is in Acts 2. When we give, we also need to lead by example for the next generation to see. If we see giving back to God and being generous as optional, or we are poor examples of it, then the next generation will follow suit. They may not be willing to let go of everything to follow God, and they will become slaves to material wealth. And it can become generational sin that is passed down. So I hope that list is helpful if there's anyone struggling to make a decision about um, the resources that you have and how to give back and where to use them. Uh, I also want to address tithing briefly because I know some people have questions about it. Um, just bear with me a little bit longer. So um, Phil shared an article with me from churchleaders.com. I think this is a different one about tithing that we'll post, but tithing can be a debate and a divisive issue in the church. Some of us may be wondering, um, should you still tithe and give 10% of your income or what is tithing? Um, should I tithe my gross income or my net income? Does God expect me to give if I'm struggling with my finances? Isn't giving my time enough? And so these questions all have the same recurring theme where we're trying to give ourselves an out maybe. What's the least amount that I can give? Uh, if we think that way, we're missing the point because biblical generosity isn't about giving the minimum. Uh, it's about surrendering, surrendering it all to our all-powerful, all-loving God, a God who gave everything in his son, Jesus. And giving, it affirms um, and it says that we believe that Christ is Lord in our lives. It dethrones us and it exalts him. So is it possible that maybe you're limiting God with your giving are you unwilling when the Holy Spirit prompts you to give further? Maybe God is calling us to give more financially or more time than we ever have before. He wants our whole heart, not just the first 10%. So what if we're struggling to let go of our wealth? Um, maybe we struggle like the rich man and we have great wealth and we struggle to let go of that um, or to give. To answer that, there's this other article um, that we will post as well about generosity that mentions um, Rich Velotis's thoughts on tithing. Uh, we did a series um, loosely framed around his book, The Deeply Formed Life, uh, last year, earlier this year, I can't remember. Um, but Rich Velotis says that when we give to God, it is a formational practice that can help us grow into maturity. Money has a hold on us in devious ways. And when we give, we loosen the grip that money has on us. Tithing is a way of training our lives to become like our generous Lord and live in greater freedom from attachments. So what if we don't have enough money and we struggle or enough time? What if we're in that kind of situation? Then how about choose a percentage to give? Start somewhere and ask for God's grace to grow your capacity to give to show you what he will do with what you give. Even if you can't see the harvest of it or you don't think that it's much, maybe 1%, 2%, 5%, or one or two hours, three hours a week, of, uh, a week of your time. Because God can see our hearts. Again, it's not about how much, but it's about the heart and where we're at. And as we give out of the little that we might feel we have. And we give not because we want to receive back, but because we've already been given much. So to quote him directly, Rich Velotis says here that we cannot control God's grace based on generosity. Over the course of my life, there were times when I generously gave and God blessed me. And then there were times when I didn't generously give and God still blessed me, he shared. Generosity is not about controlling God's hand. We can't manipulate God's grace. Generosity is for our maturity. God doesn't need our money, but he wants proof that he is first in our lives. He wants us to trust him completely and grow our faith. And being able to give back to him and his good purposes 
that he calls us to is a demonstration of that. And the more that we can trust him, the more he can use us to reveal his glory and be a vessel for his work. And the more that our faith is tested and grows. Jesus didn't come to this earth to die for our sins, to redeem us and save us, just so that we could chase after possessions to keep for ourselves. He didn't create us for the purpose of building up wealth and then not having a relationship with him, our creator. So don't serve money. Let it serve you for God's purposes. A couple of things to leave you guys with. We have reflection and discussion questions um, for yourself or for life group. I think it's going to be some interesting discussion in life group as we talk about Jesus and money. So do you serve money or do you serve God and let money serve you for his purposes? What's your attitude and posture when it comes to money and possessions? Has money caused a separation between you and God? Is there a greed in your heart that you need to seek forgiveness for? Is God asking you to make a change about how you steward what you have been given? Are you keeping something for yourself that God wants you to give back to him? And we'll also post some extra resources uh, like supplementary passages and those two articles I just mentioned on tithing and generosity. I know some of you have been asking about a suggested uh, format for life group. So that's going to be in the slides as well. Just um, go to our Facebook group for that with our news and updates. Hope City Community Hub request to join. Um, Okay, so I hope that helps. Um, Let's pray. Lord God, we acknowledge that you have given to us all that we have. Help us to seek heavenly treasures and not be enslaved by greed and idolatry, swept away by desires for wealth and power. God, we want to honor you and use what you have given to us for your glory. And help us be generous with what we have and guide us to opportunities where we can serve others' needs with our time, our skills, our belongings, our finances, and our influence. And let there not be a hold of greed on anyone in this room in your powerful and mighty name, but vulnerability and humility to talk about stewardship, to share our struggles about it, and to give as you lead us. May we offer our lives as a sacrifice and offering to you. Amen.